Welcome to this webinar. Along with the tourism industry, cultural and creative sectors are among the most affected by the current coronavirus crisis. In these unprecedented times, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, is joining forces with its, with its partners to try to understand the impact on our, on our sectors uh, and how policies, cities and regions, but also national governments can support these sectors. We organize a series of talks in April starting today with the talk on museums and then next Friday we'll look into creative and cultural sectors more broadly and at the end of the month we offer a training opportunity for policymakers and practitioners through our digital academy for cultural and creative industries. Together with Peter Keller, Director General of ICOM, I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers and you will see them live uh, in a moment. We have Mattia Nieti who joins us from Venice where he is the Executive Secretary of the Foundation of Venice City Museums. We have Nathalie Bondil with us, who is the Director General and Chief Curator of the Montreal uh, Fine Arts Museum. We have Nkung Chang, who is joining from Korea, where she is a Founding Director of the Iron Museum. We have John Davis, Economic Research Fellow in Nesta and in the Creative Industries Policy Evidence Center in the UK. Uh, we have also a commission with us, the European Commission, Maciej Hoffman is a policy officer in the European Commission, Director General for Education and Culture. And Antonio Lampis is Director General of Museums in the Italian Ministry of Culture and Tourism. And we also have Juan Roca, who is a Director of MUBA, Barcelona History Museum in Spain. With this, Peter, I would like to invite you to welcome our participants and also to open the webinar. Thank you very much, Katja, for the introduction. Allow me a few words on the situation of museums worldwide. The pandemic and the subsequent lockdown severely affect the cultural and creative sectors and affect museums. According to a survey I can launch, almost all museums around the world are closed. Maybe 5% are still open. The financial impact of the lockdowns and the closures will depend on the ownership, the funding, and the size of the museum. According to a survey by NEMO in Europe, big museums and museums in touristic areas report 75 or 80 percent loss of income. The bigger the percentage of income from ticket and retail, the more immediate and more immense the impact. Museums which are mainly publicly funded won't see the impact immediately and not for our professionals but later. However, freelance museum professionals are right now losing income for example, in conservation in France or in education in Germany. And there we are speaking about 7,000 professionals. Museums are already adapting to the situation during the closure. Many of them are focusing on online activities and to websites. Visits to museum websites have risen by up to 500%. ICOM, as the International Council of Museums, is working in three directions to support professional museums monitoring the sector, publishing recommendations and best practice examples with the help of experts in our network. And we also published a statement last week to urge policy and decision makers to rapidly allocate relief funds to ensure sustainability of museums. We will develop advocacy, advocacy tools for museums and for ICOM's national committees to highlight the important role museums play in the local economy and sustainable development as well as in community well-being and resilience. And the guide on local development, OECD and ICOM published last year, and I think you will present it, uh, Katja, is an important instrument as well. The pandemic and the lockdowns present manifold um, challenges. According to our survey, a large majority, nine out of 10 respondents expect museums programs to be reduced, one out of four expect staff to be reduced and almost one out of 10 expect their museums to be closed permanently. Now, more than ever, we need innovative strategies and concrete policy actions. We are aware that this is not a simple matter of keeping our institutions alive, but also mobilize their efforts and capacities to change. Museums are already responding to the situation and it's fascinating to see the diverse and innovative creative solutions they put in place. I'm confident that museums will cope with this situation as they have done before. Thank you once again to OECD for hosting this webinar and thank you to all those who are joining us from around the world for your interest.
a warm welcome on behalf of ICON to our speakers. We all look forward to your reflections and contributions. I'm sure what we will be discussing today will also resonate to those working in other areas in the cultural and creative sectors, perhaps even beyond. Thank you all. Thank you, Peter. Uh, last year in Kyoto, together, together with uh, ICOM, we launched uh, the OECD ICOM Guide for Local Governments, Communities and Museums. And this guide highlights the role of museums as agents of local economic and social change. Indeed, museums create jobs, they bring revenues, they are anchor institutions for many communities. Across the world, they're at the heart of many urban regeneration projects. They can contribute to community development. They also contribute to people's well-being and support inclusion by working with many other partners like schools, prisons, hospitals, job centers. And all these areas are, of course, very important for local development and will be even more so in the post-crisis recovery. So it is in this broader perspective, local development perspective, that we would like to place our debate today. Uh, our discussion will focus on three issues. First of all, we would like with our panel speakers to understand better what are the impacts on museums of the current crisis. Then we'd like to look into these new things that are developing, innovations and opportunities and game changers that we would like to bring with us into the post-crisis uh, times. And of course, we would like to discuss the policies uh, that should be put in place to support the museum sector. If we look at uh, a little bit at the impacts that uh, the current crisis has on, on museums, of course, uh, museums across the world, uh, both public and private, see their revenues drop, and which puts their financial sustainability at risk. The American Alliance of Museums estimates that up to 30% of American museums, and mostly in small and rural areas, uh, will not reopen if there is no uh, immediate financial assistance. In addition to uh, earnings uh, and in addition to losses in earned revenues, museums are expecting also a drop and in a decrease in charitable contributions and donations. And we need to understand that even in optimistic scenarios, time will be needed uh, to get to the pre-crisis levels of international and domestic tourism. And this means that uh, in the medium term perspective, museums might have much less resources even for their core functions. And of course, this reduced revenues impact on jobs, on jobs in the museums, but also around the museums. We see around the world that museums have to reduce wages, cut uh, layoff staff, especially uh, temporary staff, external uh, contracts. And more than that, there is a structural threat to the survival of companies and freelancers who don't work in the museums. They work outside of the museums, but they are really vital for the work of the museums. And of course, we see that most of the local development projects in which museums participate are now put on hold. And in the future, museums uh, will have much less capacity and resources to participate in this project. But let's try to also uh, look into the bright side of the picture. The context is of course unprecedented, but so is the vitality of museums. We cannot go to museums, but museums come to us. And we, we can see all these different um, uh, museum and chill, culture chez nous, and uh, all sorts of other digital platforms that are emerging. And uh, as you said, Peter, uh, the digital offer is very much in demand today. For example, in Louvre, they, I think they see that if before the crisis, they had 40,000 visitors per day of their website. Now it's 400 per day, 400,000 per day. Uh, so what does it mean really? What, what, what is happening? I think we see the, really a, an increased recognition of the role of culture uh, plays for our societies and for people's well-being and mental health. We see this increased attention and recognition of the link between culture and education. And uh, I give a special sign to those of us who are homeschooling uh, today and really benefit from this um, link between schools and museums where they continue to join forces and provide very interesting educational content. Uh, to us uh, parents. Uh, and of course, there is an increased level of trust in cultural institutions that can be capitalized also in the post uh, uh, crisis times and the recovery. And obviously, digital becomes very, very important. So, what 
do we need to support this, uh, the museum sector and, and the uh, eco museum ecosystem, the people and firms that are around the museums? We see that across the countries, uh, uh, governments and cities are putting in place different support measures. Uh, and of course, the support measures should, should uh, uh, help the museums, but also, as I was saying, the ecosystem uh, uh, around them. And we're talking about emergency financial assistance, tax and rent reliefs, both for public and private museums, income support measures, access to business support programs, and tax incentives for donations and charities. And while we all wait to be able, hopefully rather soon than late, uh, rejoin this queue, and this is a queue for the Pompidou Center in Paris, uh, let's now turn to our panel members to hear their, their views on these three issues. Um, so our first question is a question about the impact of the current crisis on museums and their communities and their ecosystem. I would like now to turn to Nathalie Bondil uh, from Montréal BAM, uh, the Montréal Museum of uh, Fine Arts. Nathalie, can you share with us your perspective on what's happening? My, thank you. Thank you, Ekaterina. Thank you, everybody, for this uh, great initiative. Um, in fact, uh, uh, I would like to enhance today donc, uh, the very different and various situations among museums because, of course, uh, now as I am uh, exchanging a lot with my colleagues uh, from public museums, uh, for example, in France or in Ottawa, where the um, staff is protected by an administrative uh, statue, uh, it is very, very different uh, what we are living right now uh, through this crisis. Uh, of course, for uh, private museums, I mean in Canada, like the Glenbo or the, the other museums in the United States, uh, sometimes don't they had to uh, do some very, very drastic decision like 80% of layoff with their uh, staff <clears throat> for us, uh, as like, um, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, uh, we, are, uh, we are a private museum, but we do receive a grant from our province uh, government, so provincial government. So we are really facing uh, like uh, many little enterprises, uh, huge uh, challenges with liquidities, with the cash flow. So it is an unprecedented um, situation because uh, now we are to uh, make rather difficult decision or to be a very creative in term uh, saying or oh, we keep don't, our staff but for some uh, board members don't, uh, they do not want to keep people who are not able to work uh, one hundred um, percent time uh, and they can't uh, do some teleworking or do we have to be more um, creative? So um, in region for a much smaller museum, I even discussed with some directors who are alone. They do not have anybody with them. So uh, I think that it is very important now just to understand the variety of uh, our uh, situations and which explain donc, the variety of uh, what we are doing and of our decisions. Yes, th th thank you very much, Natalie. And of course, the, the contexts are different across the globe uh, and uh, for public and private museums and for small and, and, and large ones. But even for public museums, one could think that they benefit from public supports. But in many countries, up to 40% or even more of their revenues come from tickets or other commercial activities. Uh, so, and in many other countries, they also have to pay huge, uh, mm. Uh, they have to pay, for example, for their rent, which can be also a big chunk of their revenues as well. So even for stable public museums, the situation is not uh, uh, easy at all. And uh, if I can just add one point, uh, is as you said, what is important is not just for the museum, but for the whole ecosystem, because uh, we need also to uh, support the ecosystem. And I'm uh, thinking about the artist position. Uh, which is rather difficult right now. And so we really have to be creative, but we have some solutions. Very good. And I'm eager to hear more on the solutions late, later during this webinar. 
Uh, Mattia Agnetti, Executive Secretary of the Foundation of the Venice City Museums. Now I would like to turn to you, and of course I cannot not remind ourselves of the title of the last year's Venice Biennale, May One Live in Challenging Times. But, oh, uh, yeah. Yes, very much indeed, Katerina. Thank you very much for inviting me here. And by the way, we, this is the second big challenge we are facing after the, the Aqua Alta last November. So it's uh, one after the other. Uh, but coming back to your question, um, as, um, as Natalie said, I think uh, there might be uh, different situations when it comes to the management of the museums, whether they are publicly owned or they are private institutions. To this regard, they definitely share uh, the uh, shortage in terms of revenues, no doubt, because even public institutions, with few exceptions in some countries, nevertheless benefit of the ticketing, for instance. And of course, uh, uh, this uh, uh, total lockdown uh, is going, it impacts not only now, but even the, the months ahead, and will definitely impact at least in, for one year time, I think. Uh, I personally think we will only uh, start again to operate on a normal basis just in let's say in 10 to 12 months time. Um, as I said there are many differences. Nathalie mentioned the, the status of the workers, the employees, those uh, uh, let's say being uh, supported directly by the public and those instead who are right now facing, which is our case for instance, uh, a stop in their a contract. Right now we are like a car who was used to, to drive very fast and now we're driving very slow. We try to keep the engine alive nevertheless and so there are still the basic functions. Um, I think uh, what I think it, it what impacted immediately what I noticed um, it's that uh, what before was just a, a complementary offer in terms of cultural and scientific offer meaning the digital uh, offer, it's now became suddenly uh, the only a unique offer we as museums are able to deliver. Uh, this is an element to think about. Um, another issue which I think, uh, especially in the medium term, mm, I think uh, uh, it's good to, to consider is that the potential restraint of uh, scientific and cultural projects which the museums, both public and private, will be able to deliver. And that is, will be primarily due to the, let's say, to the decreased resources available. No doubts about it, because even if in some countries, European countries, such as Italy, for instance, we are, there's a, there's a current debate on it, thinking about uh, additional funds for culture as, a, as an engine for a, a future uh, relaunch. Of, the, of our societies. Uh, nevertheless, uh, my opinion is that at the very beginning, uh, there will be a lack of resources. And so uh, the museums will have to be able to find in them, themselves, let's say, the resources to, uh, to provide the, call, the cultural uh, offer. And this will have to be complemented, to my opinion, with uh, a necessary international cooperation between institutions which is of course right now available, it's now implemented, but it will become more and more uh, common. And I personally think this will, uh, will benefit not only the cultural project itself, but the whole uh, staff and people involved in the, the museums, also in terms of exchanges of know-how and uh, capacities, uh, let's, like training between uh, people involved in the museums. I mean, Ekaterina, there are many things we could discuss and uh, point out, uh, in, uh, but unfortunately, I think we have only a few minutes each. Maybe I can come back later. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and, and of course, well, maybe I, I take a few points that indeed uh, the recovery will take uh, long, uh, most likely. Well, we can't expect it to, uh, to come back like in a couple of weeks, but as you say, maybe 10, 12 months uh, are needed. Uh, and, and you're right to point out to the impact on the scientific and cultural projects in the medium and maybe longer term as well. 
And as you say, digital is now the only solution, but how sustainable that is, I wonder, and should pay for access be introduced in some, at some stage if the lockdown continues? And, but if yes, then how we really can include those who don't have the resources or whose resources are being reduced now in the current context. And, and, and I think you are absolutely right that uh, maybe on the bright side of things, uh, there will be more international and national cooperation. And we saw that uh, after the 2008 crisis, when many museums had to pull their resources together, the back office and that's really led to quite a number of uh, innovations. So thank you so much, uh, Mathieu. And now I would like to turn to Joan, Joan uh, Roca from uh, Barcelona, please. The first thing to say is that, yes, as Natalie said, the impact of the crisis clearly differs from one type of museum to another. From the museums that depend entirely on their income from ticketing, where the downfall has been immediate to the museums that mostly depend on the public budget and have been able to lessen the blow. That's true. But in all cases, museums are not alone. Museums are just the tip of an iceberg, of a complex cultural, social and economic system, such as those concerning literature, or theater or cinema, with very diverse professionals and companies working in it. And it's important to say that because decision makers many times don't know that. They talk about museums. No, museums are uh, the top of a very big cultural ecosystem in which you can find very, very different kinds of jobs which do different tasks. Most of them have been uh, in outsourcing in the last years. And for example, for conservation and restoration of collections research to produce knowledge and to share it in lectures and seminars, production of exhibitions, audiovisuals, books, apps, public programs and activities, participatory social projects, education, visits, urban tours, maintenance and attention to the public. It's a very complex eco -cultural, uh, uh, cultural ecosystem that is now endangered. In the short term, so it's very different if you can cope with the situation as was in our case because the authorities help you to say oh don't go uh, too far try to keep everybody paid and try not to uh, have uh, somebody fired but in as a whole a lot of workers are being laid off at least temporarily that's a big drama because it's a very extremely fragile professional network that can be lost because it suffered already a lot in the financial crisis in 2008 and so on. So most companies were already recovering and now have the problem. So well, uh, so to say, after all, museums uh, are just the big top of an ecosystem that could be in a disaster if we don't react in mid term and long term carrying the fact that we could be phagocytated by a few big companies. The risk of dissolving this rich ecosystem and seeing how a few companies take care of it, it's very dangerous. So we would need a reconstruction policy, a Marshall Plan for Museums, to enhance a sector with a high cultural, social and economical productivity. And here, the role of municipalities can be really strategic to redirect the potential of museums in the future. Of course, I'm not talking about doing the same than before. And that's important because museums were already in a process of big change. So the crisis can also be an opportunity to innovate. But that's next question, I think. Yes, uh, Joan, thank you so much uh, also for highlighting this, uh, as you say, iceberg or ecosystem uh, dimension. So the impact is really much broader than just uh, on the museums. And uh, as you also mentioned, uh, well, probably uh, a lot of museums, they underwent these different degrees of outsourcing in the past years. And maybe that's also one of the, um, well, reasons for the current uh, situation where we have to also look very attentively into this uh, 
uh, ecosystem, which is vital for the museum's uh, work. And I also see some reactions from our participants that they say, yes, indeed, bravo, that's the outsourcing uh, thing that uh, maybe uh, we should look into in, in, in the future. Uh, now I would like to turn to Inkung Chang from Korea, if you could also share with us your perspective on what's happening, what is the impact that you see on museums and maybe their wider networks. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry, okay. Thank you. After the official closing of national museums in Korea on February 25th, the Korean Museum Association took a quick survey on the damaged status of the private museums and art galleries for one month period of time in February. Uh, 122 museums replied and it was um, reported that it, they already had a severe decrease in income along with partners, artists, hospitality service providers and exhibit developers and many more. Between the 122 museums, the estimated immediate income loss for a month was more than 1 million US dollars, even though at the time, 40% uh, of the museums are still open, operating. Unlike national museums, small private museums are facing uncertainty to maintain their facilities and staff for a prolonged period without a steady income. As mentioned, um, Natalie and Mattia and Joan already mentioned about this, you know, uh, ticket sales and, and uh, so forth. The employees are forced to work at homes and salaries are cut or asked to take an unpaid vacation due to the lack of uh, cash flow. The long-term effects of this pandemic crisis on museums are hard to predict concretely, yet it is inevitable that this crisis has altered the social ecology profoundly and the economic downturn is inescapable. It shows how vulnerable a museum is to be in this state of emergency, even for a short time. Social distancing for health and safety precautions changed social behavior and also affected traditional mode of communication and delivery of museum contents. While more prominent and affluent museums equipped with a digital infrastructure already started web-based services. However, small budget museums have not been able to develop digital data and uh, programs to communicate and market its content to the public. The discrepancy in digital literacy and infrastructure between the museums may further distance the quality of museum operations and services for less privileged museums to the public. On the brighter side of long-term impacts of this crisis is that it will expand the scope of museum experience for visitors. And it can be an opportunity for museums to attract non-conventional audiences and partners in global scale 24 seven. While we are waiting to reopen our physical facilities and spaces to the public and coping with the financial uncertainty, museums can re-examine uh, its mission and current operating norms and skills to be ready uh, for the, this huge paradigm shift and museum functions and management. Thank you. Thank you so much. And also thank you for bringing and sharing with us the results of the survey, which is most uh, interesting. Uh, well, I think uh, now in this session, we had quite a broad and good panorama and covered quite a, a number of issues. So we're starting to understand a bit better what's happening with the museum sector and the sectors uh, around it. So shall we maybe move into the second question and see, we already started to touch upon this and see what the kind of innovations are, are being put in place. What will the rules of the game change or are there any game changes that we'll want to bring into uh, the future? So uh, for this, uh, maybe I would go back to Joan. Would you like to share with us your perspective on this? Well, I think that if museums are not really innovating uh, under the crisis, it's because 
they were already an innovative sector. Nothing begins like that from zero. We are innovating because the innovative process were already at stake. ICOM proposed a new definition of museums in Kyoto, which was postponed. Well, I think that now we need it urgently. We need a new generation of museums that combine cultural innovation and social cohesion on the one hand, with local economic development on the other hand. The conception of museums as public institutions of knowledge, inherited from the Enlightenment, must be recovered. And the digital revolution can help, but it will be dead if it's only technological. And here, I would like to stress five ideas to make it more transformative. First one, digital revolution, okay, but it should be a narrative revolution. We need comprehensive narratives to place objectives, uh, excuse me, objects, buildings, and landscapes. But to really improve narratives, we need to recover museums as research nodes in different fields, as it has been already said. Second, heritage revolution. Virtual museums, even with the best digital resources, do not eliminate the need for collections or face-to-face -face public activities. Look, without objects and documents, a museum would be like a currency without the endorsement of gold or wealth. So, a fake museum. Third, organiz organizational revolution. If these days of telecommuting are transforming museums, that is because suddenly their internal organization and their links with institutions have become more flexible. And that's the case also with their global intercity contacts, which have been strengthened. So now there is a flexible moment to go and push new things. Fourth, citizen revolution. That's very important for me. Museums can be crucial for cultural democracy in the near future, mobilizing knowledge and heritage in a digital context. How? Bringing culture and education together and reaching much more easily young people and socially deprived sectors. It's an opportunity. And fifth, tourism revolution. Yes, I think we should go to a tourism revolution. If we succeed in museums in articulating new points of view, new points of view via the web and other digital means, museums can help really to diversify objectives and to prescribe best practices for visitors. For example, in city museums, by the way, in Camoc, in City East and other networks, we are now talking about the right to the city through different ways of visiting. Citizens are, after all, people in traveling. We are citizens always. So that's what we should do and innovate, but for that, we need money. And here, just a question. Paper access, that's a question now which is being discussed, perhaps in the large museums, but in most museums, it can challenge social accessibility for little money. So I think that the way out of the crisis will not come from simple farmers. But that's next question. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, indeed, no simple uh, recipes or formulas. Uh, and, and, and thank you so much for stressing these different uh, dimensions and the flexibility, but also this uh, increased link between, well, as you say, well, knowledge and heritage, but culture and education. And uh, uh, really, there is uh, a huge potential that is being built now and that should continue in the future. Um, can I now maybe turn to Natalie, back to Montreal? Uh, what's your perspective on these issues? in terms of innovations and game changers and uh, what, what's happening. Thank you very much, um, Ekaterina. Uh, I agree with uh, Joanne. It's true that now what uh, we're uh, looking new uh, values, uh, new values are emerging in our sector. And uh, in fact, uh, we cannot consider the museum and the publics and our crowds in the same way. Uh, as it was before. Obviously, uh, the IT is uh, be becoming very, very important, and we can see that there is uh, many uh, values which are supported by the OECD and ICOM guide we launched 
uh, two years ago uh, thanks to this crisis. This is a good aspect of this crisis. For example, uh, we are enhancing the fact that uh, museums are very important for well-being and health, and especially mental health. And, uh, it's exactly something we can uh, do right now uh, through our programming and especially thanks to our uh, platform, digital platform. Uh, also, that we are seeing some uh, our IT becoming archives, not just a promotional platform, but also archives. For example, there are many curators who are talking about their collection. There are many artists who talk about their works. There are even some grants uh, given to artists in order them to uh, create some uh, documentation of uh, this uh, crisis, this moment. And third, I would say education. Education because, uh, for example, uh, we have a very important uh, educative platform uh, called Educart. And uh, now, because so many parents uh, need to learn their, to their children at home, uh, this platform has been uh, chosen by our Minister of Education. Donc, uh, it is now a learning uh, resources uh, on the official website. We uh, also uh, partner with many uh, school boards, donc, uh, thanks to this platform. So uh, we see that uh, there is uh, many new aspects which will help us to uh, show uh, how role and to enhance our mission uh, in a more social way. Uh, I, we do not think that blockbusters uh, programming and uh, will be uh, uh, as relevant uh, in after this crisis. And this is why uh, it's also because uh, we'll have to deal with new uh, sanitary rules uh, in our institutions. And in fact, I would be very happy to know more about the Korea example. Uh, we are learning about uh, uh, those uh, new sanitary rules. We'll have less uh, people in our uh, galleries, but maybe we will uh, insist on the quality much more than about the quantity. And I think that's exactly in the way uh, we were discussing in Kyoto about the new definition. Uh, I'm a great supporter for uh, including two words in the official uh, definition, uh, inclusion and well-being. And I think that there is a wonderful opportunity with this crisis to take this uh, um, um, this profile and to uh, reinforce uh, our place uh, in the recovery of our societies and cities. This is yes, my uh, excellent. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. And I just want to remind also our participants that your museum was one of the real champions in the field of uh, culture and uh, well-being and, and mental health. And well, uh, as probably many of you know, doctors in Quebec can prescribe museum visits, uh, which are reimbursed as well. So that's a really true recognition of the impact uh, cultural participation can have on our well-being and, uh, and our health, uh, which is becoming quite obvious today, but maybe was less obvious uh, before this crisis. I very much liked your point on this uh, enhanced mission uh, uh, and the well or as you were saying enhance the mission of museums in a more social way so maybe the era of blockbusters uh, is over soon so it's uh, maybe less uh, with more quality etc so that's a really very interesting uh, point and if that's the trend this will be inter very interesting to observe i see that maybe matia wanted to uh, react to your comments maybe we hear to matia and then we move to john no, just, just very quickly, Katerina, I just wanted to compliment what uh, John and Natalie said and say that, I mean, this is a turning point in our industry, I think, um, unfortunately, to some extent. Uh, I think we have to take advantage of it. So this is uh, the time ahead. Uh, it will have to be used to, to rethink the way we uh, manage the museums and also the way we deliver the services to the public. And I think there is an issue which might be uh, further strengthened, and it, that is the basically the investing on the professionals, on the profiles of the people working in the museums. And I think this can be done, especially if you strengthen the links between the museums themselves and the world of the universities, for instance. Uh, of course, we cannot apply the same rule everywhere in the world. There are already more advanced uh, situations. 
but there are definitely many, many areas in which uh, uh, right now there's only an academic link, whereas I think we should strengthen the operational uh, uh, link and therefore the opportunity for students, uh, graduates and postgraduates in uh, and the, uh, offering them the opportunity to enter uh, directly the museum career. Uh, that's, uh, I think, as I said, this is a turning point. So all these issues will have to be addressed. Definitely ICOM is the, the platform and the, the, the arena where to discuss it. Um, and the very last point, it's about uh, the, the flexibility which will be further required by the public, by our visitors. Already in the, in the recent years, all of us, uh, we experienced uh, a big change uh, in terms of uh, uh, audience uh, requests, audience need. And we all know that museums are no longer just, uh, you know, uh, premises uh, to visit the permanent collections or the exhibitions, but uh, became more and more places where people meet, uh, interact, uh, experience different ways of culture. And uh, to this extent, I think we should work on that even further. And uh, mm, even here, there are more advanced experiences, but I think the overall, uh, what we would need is maybe to set up a sort of a, um, a common ground, a minimum common ground for all museums, so that uh, you can deliver quality services and quality culture of high level as from this ground upwards. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mathieu. And you bring this new um, dimension uh, about the importance of investing in skills of museum professionals and this uh, need to build an operational link with universities. So that's a very uh, valid point. Uh, I think, um, Natalie, you also uh, um, sent a sign when you were speaking to uh, Inkyung, as you were saying, you would be interested in uh, for, in learning more from the Korean experience of getting out of the uh, lockdown and uh, um, to see how that works. But maybe let's hear first from John, uh, and then we uh, give a bit of time to Inkyung to think about her answer to this question. Uh, John Davis, could you maybe share with us your perspective? Uh, thanks, Katarina, and I also endorse many of the themes that the previous speakers have raised. I think one interesting way into the digital question is to look at the level of digital participation in museums before the crisis. And in the UK, we have such, some evidence for this. So in England, about around half the population visit a museum, adult population visit museums in a given year. And of those, around 60% will visit the website to book tickets or check out exhibitions that they, they're interested in. But if we look at the extent to which people were checking out digital collections, that's much lower. It's around 16% of the people visited. Or if it's a digital tour, uh, it, it's lower still. It's about 11%. Now, obviously, not all, all, all museums have uh, uh, an online tour, say, or a full digital collection. Um, but I think the gap between the, the level of participation, at, physical participation before, and the digital participation with, with the collection, with the tools, shows that there is a sense of uh, opportunity now. There's more attention on museums' digital offer to kind of build the audience in that space and, and highlight some of the good work that's been going on for, for some time in that area. In terms of the, I guess, the Another way, the, the key part of museum's digital presence is, is social media. And so the organization that I work for, for Nesta, has done a survey of cultural institutions' use of digital. And one of the things that, that came back from it, and this won't surprise people, is that almost all cultural institutions, and that will include museums these days, have a, a Facebook account, uh, a Twitter account. But what they, those accounts are used for uh, can, can vary, vary quite a lot. So a reasonable number of uh, institutions will be, I'd say, uploading me, uh, sorry, uh, films to, to, to social media. But if you look at stuff that might be particularly relevant for the current crisis, at least when we did the survey a year or so ago, the extent to which organizations, I think it was about 11%, were, were streaming pure digital events on social media is much, is much lower. And that's, that, that is, in a sense, an opportunity because there isn't that much activity the sector's been doing, at least I'm speaking from the perspective of, of the UK so far, 
Um, but obviously perhaps uh, some skill development training is needed to, to encourage growth in the area. And the third point uh, I'd, I'd like to, to make, and I guess this is uh, something that was happening before, but perhaps gets more attention uh, now uh, in the current uh, difficult, difficult situation. And that is that on, on social media, on, on Twitter, you have museum professionals, curators, museum staff, sharing and talking about aspects of museums that, that they care passionately about. Uh, and that was going on before uh, the current difficult situation, but I think that's a very positive development and provides a new kind of way to, for museums to engage with their, their audience, or at least to engage with, it, with them to, to greater effect in, in that area. Because I think it, I mean, obviously if, if one's very used to, to dealing with museums and very familiar with them, that's, then, then, they, then it becomes more second nature. But if for people who are less familiar or, or didn't necessarily go to them as kids, having people talking passionately about things they, they care a lot about, uh, in this difficult situation, I think that that's a very positive development and one that may allow museums to engage uh, a wider audience in, in future. Yeah, so th those were three points I wanted to, to raise. Thank you so much, jo John, for the uh, for these three uh, points. I wanted now to maybe briefly uh, go back to Nkyung, if you would like to share with us your reflection on how the social distancing measures will impact on the number of visitors and the way museums will organize them visits in the near future. What's your take on this? Let's see, digital, digital, can you hear me? Yes, digital literacy and, and infrastructure is, is uh, will provide uh, open the new opportunity and, and potentials but it is we we have to understand the digital exhibition is different from the um the physical exhibition because traditionally people think that you know we put the take pictures and videos and they put it on uh, in a website and that's digital exhibition but it's not because digital museum experience will be totally different. Uh, I cannot say that I know the digital museum experience is, uh, how is it different from the traditional museum experience? But there is a huge potential and also huge potential marketing uh, uh, opportunities, which has not been explored uh, uh, in great uh, depth. And, and also the, the only, uh, um, Different challenge is that we need to train ourselves because our education background is not equipped with a digital literacy. So it's a whole new paradigm shift and we have to really change our thinking. Otherwise, even though there's a fancy programs and, and uh, 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 apps that we can use, but how can we get into um, the visitors mind that we can deliver the contents so they can uh, be creative and uh, create uh, rebuild the culture and and exchange it's, there's a whole new um, level of um, skills that we need to to explore and learn and and it's very important uh, not just to have the fancy computer or fancy cell phones, that it's not the digital literacy, that we have to educate existing staff members. And also it's very important that we have to work with, as previously mentioned, that it's important that we work with um, uh, unconventional partners worldwide now. It's, it's available now. So the museum profession will be redefined because traditionally that is academic background uh, is needed to, to work at museums, but there's a new, you know, totally new sets of skills needed to, to, uh, to communicate. So that's my comments. Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much. And once again, you highlight and then underline this uh, skills dimension and uh, well, the, the fact that in fact, uh, the uh, borders, the frontiers between sectors are now being blurred and all these crossovers and uh, contaminations uh, are, will be happening much at a much uh, quicker pace uh, in, in the future. And uh, maybe that's also, uh, this will be the real source of innovation. Before we move on to the next round of discussions, I think uh, Antonio Lampis uh, was giving a sign that he wanted to also to share with us his views on some of these questions. Antonio, please. Okay, thank you. So um, I really agree um, with um, John and Matthias say, uh, I think this is the time of alliance, of alliances. So I think that the, the museum uh, was that cultural institution within the recent year uh, really uh, was able to adapt to the changes uh, to in the, um, in the changes of the contemporary society. But now uh, also we need an um, alliance with, not only with the university, uh, I can um, explain the, um, what's happening in Italy. We, we ask um, each university to adopt a museum. And, um, and but now we we need um, alliance with uh, TV uh, televisions. Um, we need alliance uh, with uh, new system of payment like uh, contactless, like system to um, control the, the the quarter, the people that can uh, enter in the museum in this in this time. And we need uh, alliance with theater, with screenwriters, with writing experts to collect be a better story, to uh, know how, how to create um, new stories. Because as a, um, the vision is, uh, um, so if you, uh, I can share a screen, it's possible. No, okay. Uh, so the vision is this, um, the museum will be um, more sustainable in, 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 the, in the next month, in the next years. Um, if, you, uh, if you be a sort of Netflix, uh, where you can go to, um, to see and listen some new story, that are full of connection with the experience of the life of the visitors, this of the listener, this is uh, um, the, the, the new challenge of the museum, but the museum, the museums was um, that cultural institution who was uh, really um, able to to change in the last year. So we have, um, I think, in Italy, a leading role to move to the attention to the to the things to um, persons, and um, and this. Um, emphasize uh, to effect effective knowledge and experience is uh, a capital now, uh, is a big capital um, that we can use to, to resolve this challenge. Uh, we had a, a three years plan um, of digital environments for the museum and now the, uh, is, is working. So we, we put uh, 10,000 of vigilance in um, smart working and uh, they are in this moment in telelearning because for many many years they don't have occasion to uh, develop their, 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 their learning and the professional um, better learning and now, now is the moment so I think that this uh, mm, this idea to to convert temporarily or not temporarily the museums, um, because uh, we know that the crisis there are um, recurrent. There are not just now the COVID. Uh, we 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 experience terrorism or uh, recurrent crisis, and uh, this um, this moment is very good to uh, to use um, what the museum have. In, in our revolution and uh, I think in the coming years we will see uh, this new alliance and the museum there was um, 
he was uh, a protagonist of uh, the cultural the cultural uh, environment as uh, Johan says. Very good. Thank you so much, um, Antonio. Now I think uh, we can move into the uh, last uh, session of our webinar, which is about the policy support measures that uh, cities, regions, national governments, supranational authorities can put in place to address all these different challenges that uh, museums and their communities and their ecosystems are facing uh, today. So um, here I maybe give the floor back to uh, Antonio, who is, uh, well, once again, uh, Director of Museums in the uh, Italian Ministry of Culture and Tourism. What's your perspective um, uh, on the supports that uh, a national authority can uh, provide for the museum community? Can you maybe say a few words about what's uh, being done in Italy and what can still be done in, in the future? So, uh, the COVID damages, uh, uh, the, the museum was in Italy, there, there was uh, since the 8th of March closed, and uh, uh, I can speak for the state's uh, own museum, there are, they are um, 400 more or, more, more or less over the 5,000 Italian museum there. For the uh, state owned museum, there's a damage of 20 million every month. And uh, um, in this moment, uh, so the rebalancing uh, is we're waiting for a solution of, of, of um, a new government bill because we say uh, we hear <clears throat> that the European Commission there's, uh, there was. Um, able to, to, to reform the state of the main damage. And so I, I can imagine other, I can't imagine other uh, solution in this moment, because all, um, even closed the museum, the, the products, products uh, they, they have a cost, fixed cost. Uh, and this is, uh, for, for Italy, is, uh, is really important for identity and, uh, and and to be in the top of the cultural ambient uh, to, to, to save the museums. Yes, thank you very much, Antonio. Um, maybe, as you mentioned, the Commission. Can I now turn to Maciej? Would you like to say a few words about the um, measures being discussed uh, or maybe already decided upon by the Commission? Thank you, thank you, Katerina, and good morning, after, good afternoon, and good evening to, to everyone who, who is listening to us. Indeed, I'm, I wanted to tell you a few words from this uh, supranational perspective, but also linking more broadly to how, during these difficult times, uh, we can look at supporting a um, broadly understood cultural ecosystem. So, of course, uh, if you look at the European Union, the culture is, in fact, the local and national competence, according to European Union treaties, which means that, of course, European Union cannot impose anything on on EU member states, but at the same time, European Union can assist and, and help. And there is, of course, a growing pressure and uh, expectation that you uh, can act and should act in relation to culture and creative sectors. This is an expectation coming very much also from uh, pan-European networks, different thematic networks that we as the European Commission finance through Creative Europe program. Um, such a recent example here, uh, NEMO, Network of European Museum Organizations, uh, which issued this week um, uh, a report looking at uh, more than 600 museums from uh, 41 European countries through a survey. And uh, there are, of course, voices coming from different European networks, not only uh, the museums related ones, but also cultural heritage, architecture, performing arts, just to name a few. And I think this is crucial at this very, very important moment to look on the one hand at what these networks are telling us when, when we look at assessing the damage, but many of them also propose very specific solutions. I think this is something for us to, to reflect upon. Um, another very timely point, to, only two days ago, um, EU Commissioner for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture, 
as well as research and innovation, uh, Mrs. Maria Gabriel met together with, uh, with EU culture ministers, 27 uh, EU culture ministers via video conference to, to discuss together what, what, what can be done. And of course, member states were presenting their different actions uh, put in place, also including specific actions for, for museums. Uh, but the general message, I would say, from that meeting was that there is very strong willingness to, to cooperate, to exchange information and to reflect together on, on different uh, global and, 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 and uh, potential uh, European solutions. So, of course, uh, what's going to happen now is a very much enforced exchange of information on the one hand between member states, between culture ministries and different ministries to show what it's being put in place, but also looking for ways to, to, to allow these networks and different uh, actors to express themselves and also share their concerns during these difficult times. And this is also, in, in, since we're speaking in this global context here, important to, uh, to know that UNESCO is also planning to have a virtual meeting of culture ministers. This is planned for 22nd of April this month. So I think this is going to be very important also to look at uh, uh, what's going to be discussed there. Uh, when speaking about very specific EU measures, I would also divide them in, in, in specific categories. So first of all, um, this kind of, I would say, very universal measures. So you might have heard in recent weeks about different uh, European Union initiatives looking at how um, structural funds money can be used or how European Union can propose uh, um, extra money to mitigate uh, unemployment risks in an emergency situation. Or finally, how um, state aid measures can be used with uh, more flexible rules uh, allowed by the European Union. Uh, these tools are, of course, um, for different sectors, not only culture and creative sectors specifically. They are very broad, but it is very important at this moment to also look at, um, because this is very much the discretion of member states and the national level to decide whether they want to use these tools for culture and creative sectors. So this is also very much an um, important role of the, the sector and these different advocacy organizations and networks to, to try and advocate to make sure that these different big uh, uh, political uh, tools that are available are also used for the benefit of, uh, of culture and creative sectors, cultural heritage or, or museums. When looking specifically at uh, culture related tools, uh, what we are doing currently with our uh, Creative Europe program is of course looking for as much flexibility as possible. So on the one hand, of course, the ongoing calls, we have decided to extend all the deadlines. The closed calls for, for cultural cooperation projects, we're going to evaluate them as fast as possible to let the organizations know whether they will be uh, getting the funding. Um, and of course, looking at upcoming calls, we're trying to, to adjust them slightly to the, to the needs of the current situation. Then, of course, very importantly, any kind of uh, public-private instruments that can be, can be used. We have this uh, Culture and Creative Sectors Guarantee Facility under Creative Europe program. This is an instrument for uh, financial institutions. So with use of the public money, um, financial institutions that participate in this scheme can, uh, can give preferential loans to culture and creative sectors. Of course, we're going to look at it, this tool very differently now, uh, taking into consideration the, the current situation. Uh, but then what I would like to stress is that long-term planning um, is equally, if not more important in this context. Uh, since the previous speakers mentioned that we might be looking into a situation that is going to last for, uh, for months to come, we have to look at what's going to happen next. And in the EU, we are in the process now of negotiating uh, the future budget of the European Union. The European Union budgets are always decided for a period of seven years each time and we're currently negotiating the, the budget from 2021 to 2027 and this is very important in this challenging situation to make sure that uh, budgets uh, for culture are appropriate, that there is uh, enough money for culture and creative sectors not only in programs such as Creative Europe which specifically uh, addresses culture and creative sectors but also other tools um, of local and regional development uh, on research support to SMEs, any kind of public-private instruments. This is very important to, to defend uh, ambitious budget for culture in the future. So I hope uh, this is going to be the case. Uh, and then, of course, last but not least, uh, this policy collaboration that happens that we have between the European Union and, and member states. Uh, we have a number of topics we, we were going to work on um, either way, and they, of course, uh, relate to many, many specific issues that, that, that uh, other speakers mentioned, the, the question of culture and well-being, uh, the question of use of new technologies for, for museums or 
question of knowing who your digital audiences are, uh, looking at ways to linking education and culture, or last but not least, looking at the overall resilience of, uh, of cultural institutions, of artists, and looking at working conditions of artists. This is going to be very important, and we will have to find a good way to also rephrase this uh, planned uh, political collaboration to, to, to address the current challenges. And here, again, last but not least, I would like to mention the, the upcoming collaboration uh, the European Commission is, is going to have with, with OECD on maximizing the impact of culture on the local development. This is something where we will have to also reflect very much the, the current challenging situation. And we're, of course, very much looking forward to to work with OECD on this important topic, to also ask ourselves how, how cities, regions, local authorities can, uh, can best address the challenges of culture and creative sectors. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure that um, for all our European uh, participants, the messages that you were just sharing with us are very important. And we have some 700 people from uh, uh, Europe who are attending uh, our webinar right now. So thank you so much, Meche. And of course, uh, as you said, uh, uh, it will be very interesting and maybe well challenging as well to uh, work now uh, on our joint project with the cities and regions in, in Europe, given the context, but uh, maybe even more important, probably, to join forces uh, between uh, the OECD and the European Commission to assist uh, uh, our cities and regions to really help and capitalize on the potential of creative uh, sectors. Uh, if I can now turn maybe to Joan, what's your perspective? What, what are the policy supports that are being put in place and needed uh, by cities? Well, yeah, excuse me. well, I think that first of all, we should stress again that the museum ecosystem needs to be strengthened. After decades of outsourcing under very precarious condition many times. I think that we really must think in a very creative uh, system which needs a new cultural Keynesianism. We need a new cultural Keynesianism. We talk about Keynesianism in many fields, but museums must have their place, their specific place in a new paradigm as uh, Inc. Jung said, uh, agreed between many agents, between multiple agents. I would like to score five. First item, I think that the museums inherited from 19th and 20th century are not anymore the museums for the 21st century. The debate on the definition of museums, as I mentioned before, should be resumed as soon as possible. We really need the new definition to consolidate an innovative and participative atmosphere, including the key word for a new enlightened museum's era, knowledge. We have been talking a lot about knowledge, all of us in different ways. So I think that really ICOM uh, is crucial for that. And second, OECD. I think that really the debate in which local society can be enhanced by museums both as part of the cultural frame for social cohesiveness and as part of more sustainable tourism is crucial too. The local development through museums is a topic that we should push forward as OCDE has been doing. And now it's much more important than before. Third, governments, different levels of governments. That's what I said about Keynesian policies at different levels and with a specific consideration of the museum sector. The museum sector has its own specificity and it's often forgotten. Uh, in the European uh, Union, something that would be very important is to adapt the system of contracting and public tenders to the exceptionality of culture in general and to the museum sector in particular. That's very important. The system of contracting of public tenders does not adapt to museum sector, which is a very fragile ecosystem of many, many small pieces, some big pieces, but some very small pieces. And so I think we should go forward in the debate that culture is, after all, something different. Then, fourth, cities. Really, cities must be a key in the new era. Museums must be considered as ordinary facilities. 
We have always considered museums as something extraordinary. There is a museum. No. Museums should be considered as ordinary facilities wholly embedded in city life and city existence. And that would be the best way for an alternative approach to culture and to tourism at the same time. Because through cities, we can enhance both social cohesiveness and sustainable tourism if we try to find this new paradigm of local development. And finally, museums themselves. No one will pay attention to the museum sector as a whole if the museums themselves do not rethink their mission statement, their internal organization, and their financial mechanisms. Uh, Antonio talked before about uh, universities adapting, adopting museums. I think that we could be even more ambitious. Uh, at least we tried uh, in our museum to adopt universities. Museums are really a high point of culture shared by citizens, by different professions, and this place of knowledge should also be in direct contact with universities. Museums are the place where universities can share their knowledge with everybody, and museums themselves can also create new knowledge in that situation. And well, I think that after all, uh, we have a lot of work to do, but from my experience these days, with the NUBA team in Barcelona, NUBA is the Barcelona History Museum, it's a municipal museum, I would say that confinement sharpens the imagination and that it's a good moment to think about the future. And that's it. Well, thank you so much also for this message of hope uh, and inspiration uh, to all of us. Uh, before maybe I move to Natalie, I was thinking that uh, for the moment we haven't heard much about uh, uh, other actors, of course, we, we uh, I mean, focus a lot on the in, uh, local administrations, on regional, on national uh, government's ministries. But uh, what about other players? What about the private sector? Because we uh, also see that uh, quite a number of uh, private foundations who were really the supporters of arts and culture for decades now shift some of their resources to uh, the real uh, urgency to, the, uh, to support the health sectors. And also they can see... Uh, um, a huge decrease in individual donations uh, so this can also impact somehow on on the museums and we maybe can also reflect a little bit what kind of measures and uh, uh, incentives could there be to support this um, cooperation between the private sector and the museums and for, and, uh, and and cities um, as well so maybe uh, well if you have ideas on that it would be good to hear that but first of all i would like also to turn to natalie to hear your view on uh, what kind of supports, uh, innovative supports are needed uh, uh, in the current context. Thank you uh, again. Um, we can see donc, a different kind of support right now. And uh, what is the most important is the spirit of uh, constructive solidarity. We are animated by, no more by competition, by, but by, more by co-creation, co-creation or uh, co-evolution. We understand that we all uh, belong to the same ecosystem. So what we can see here in Canada is uh, first we have a special public policy coming from the federal government, which just help okay, each uh, institutions to keep their employees you know, because they want to uh, avoid a huge shutdown. We also can see uh, other um, strategy, for example, the Canada Council for the Arts or the Montreal Council for the Arts, who hurry uh, the uh, attribution of for grants and especially for artists, institutions, etc., because they desperately need some uh, cash. We also uh, see, and this is more um, from the uh, government of Quebec, the provincial government, donc, they want us to rebuild donc, our society. Their position is how can we not just save museums, but how could you help us to save the society? So they will be uh, the very, very cautious about how can we develop how can we think new strategies in order that we can collaborate with a broader um, part of our society. 
uh, talking about tourism, schools, inclusion, etc. Um, and of course, um, there are um, the private philanthropy. This is a very interesting uh, uh, strategy uh, uh, I'm working on right now with uh, some colleagues uh, in Canada, because we see that uh, some private foundations are eager uh, to keep alive um, their institution and their museum, but they will, so they will decide to give uh, an exceptional attribution uh, to museum in condition that you know, the employees and the unions will also accept to reduce their time. You know, and so they will work uh, three or four days you know, every week, etc. So you can see you know, this negotiation between the private sector and the union sector in order to keep you know, the, uh, the institution alive. So uh, all those uh, strategies of uh, solidarity uh, are very uh, inspirational, I think. And uh, I just want to, to, to end with this quote uh, made by the UNESCO a few days ago, that when we are isolated, um, culture help us to stay together. Culture is really what unify all of us. And it's true that uh, culture is a kind of essential services. And it is exactly what I can hear thanks to governments, private donors, private foundations, and uh, other public policies. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Natalie. That's really uh, great to have this broader perspective out of Europe and uh, other realities. Um, I think we are really nearing, uh, well, we almost exhausted our time. But before we uh, start to wrap up, I wanted to take a very quick comment from uh, Mattia and maybe Inkyung, if you have also uh, any, anything to share with us. And then, uh, uh, Peter, there were a lot of uh, things that were referring to ICOM, to the definition of museum. So maybe you could also uh, share with us your concluding thoughts uh, on this overall discussion. And then I will uh, invite uh, my colleague, Professor Pierre Luigi Sacco who is a senior advisor at the OECD and the head of the Venice Office on Culture and Local Development, maybe to provide his final thoughts and the sort of a wrap up of uh, key messages that we want uh, to keep in our memory out of this uh, one hour and a half of discussion. So, Matia? Uh, yes, thank you. No, very, very quickly. I think we need, uh, before ending this webinar, I think it's important that we stress once again uh, the fact that uh, in the short and medium term, what museums need are covering of operational costs rather than, uh, let's say, ad hoc project related costs, which I would rather leave it for the long term. I think all the reflections uh, we made today, uh, which will be collected are extremely useful and uh, we cannot miss them at all. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, on the short term, uh, if we want these institutions to, to be alive in 12 months time, we need to launch uh, this kind of message to all uh, those uh, in the position to finance the cultural sector, namely the museum industry. So please do not forget the operational course because only by financing the operational course you will allow not just the private but also the public institution to be open in the months to come. And uh, so to start, re, uh, let's say, reopening their doors to the visitors. Okay, that's the simple and the last comment I wanted to, to stress here. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you so much. Yes, indeed, important things uh, first. Uh, Inkyung, would you have any final thoughts you would like to share with us? Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to uh, emphasize that I can, uh, I agree more with the Jones comments and the, you know, we have to work within from ourselves to um, redefine our role and then operational um, paradigm shift. And also I'd like to uh, suggest that maybe OECD and ICOM together, that, uh, that we can prepare a comprehensive and economic and social impact analysis of this pandemic crisis on museums. Uh, 
maybe a year from now or something. So, so we can have uh, um, very concrete um, understanding and also maybe we'll find something and then we can work from that, that uh, how we can prepare better or we can steer our attention to a different ways of you know working method and and so forth so i strongly suggest that oecd uh, and i i can work again together and after the guidelines so it's a another project that i suggest thank you well thank you so much uh, uh, peter would you like to share with us your final words well um, i would uh like a question I received uh, in the meantime, uh, what a society needs that museums can provide, because I think it's, um, that what we assume what has been saying, has been said that museums play a role in local and sustainable development. Uh, you spoke about the OECD guy. But museums play a very important role in education. Maybe we didn't speak enough about that, but it's, a very important role in, for example, in, in African countries. Uh, museums contribute to uh, uh, identity, be it national or, or regional or even generational through activities for certain uh, visitor groups through the experience they offer. They strengthen, can strengthen the social cohesion and the resilience of communities. Um, I think this will be very important now when communities deal with the trauma of the pandemic. I think of Northern Italy, I think there it's extremely important that museums start to collect now rapidly and react to try to do research to offer um, programs dealing with this uh, trauma. Um, this museums and I think Natalie Bondier spoke about his about it contribute to well-being and health. Again, for certain groups, I'm thinking of programs for people with dementia, for example. And they do this, and I think there we come to the point of the definition of LAM and others made as a museum as an open space for, for social interaction with meeting places, which are really open and inclusive and uh, thus can play these very different roles or very important roles we heard about. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Peter. Uh, Pierluigi, you were in the listening mode uh, throughout this uh, discussion. Um, can you share with us your thoughts and your takeaways from uh, this talk? Thank you, Katia. Well, I think it's been an extraordinary reach discussion and it really had uh, so many interesting stimuli and I don't even try to summarize what has been said because really so many things were covered but uh, if I can simply find a red thread through some of the interventions I think that uh, one of the most uh, pro probably provocative ways but also stimulating ways to look at the situation we're in at the moment is in terms of a gigantic natural experiment imagine if uh, let's say a few months ago, we were told, imagine a moment in which all the cultural institutions are shut down at the same moment, what do you do? So sounded like science fiction, and now this is our reality. And it's an experiment because we clearly have a before and an after. So as it happens in all these circumstances, when you have a clear before and an after, it's all about change of attitudes. So how do we react in terms of the new scenario and what kind of change of attitudes are strategically needed. I think that some very interesting ideas emerged from the discussion. First of all, what is clear is that that's a unique, uh, probably once in a lifetime opportunity in trying to constructively restructure the relationship between museums, economy and society. Because what has happened today, clearly, is that museum, as, as it was said, I mean, the level of traffic of digital access to museums has been so dramatically increased that now it's clear that um, people have a very natural way to acknowledge how this uh, possibility 
to access, for example, museums from a digital mode has contributed to maintaining people's uh, psychological well-being and even mental health. Because clearly we, we live in an extremely stressful psychological situation. And the level of comfort that not only museums, but more generally, of course, all kinds of cultural contents and experiences have given is uh, before the eyes of everybody. So this kind of restructuring is extremely important. Uh, how? Well, one point that, for example, was raised in several moments is that uh, we are basically restructuring the experience of the museum itself. You know, wh one of the big problems is that we know that there are large parts of uh, social constituencies that don't feel at home in museums, they feel they, don't, they do not belong. But uh, having the possibility to access digitally means that that sense of, let's say, reverence, or let's, uh, that uh, kind of church-like experience that for somebody is so intimidating, when you have a digital access possibilities change completely. So this means that uh, the experience is being redefined, not, on, not just because, I mean, the previous kind of experience has been outdated, not at all, but clearly there are no new layers being added and these new layers can create a new family, familiarity for many constituencies toward the museum. This is an opportunity not to be wasted. The second point uh, that was raised and I totally agree is change of attitude in terms of cultural professionals. Are we prepared to the change? And uh, to a large extent, we're not. Uh, it's, it's been clear, of course, we need to support financially and uh, professionally in all ways possible our cultural professionals today. But what is also needed is a huge capability building uh, adaptation here, because clearly uh, things will not be like before. And uh, the kind of skills the kind of attitudes that are needed from cultural professionals now are profoundly different. And sometimes in museums, uh, the museum sector has, of course, some uh, shining beacons of innovation, but overall, the environment, the museum environment has been relatively slow to adapt to these new challenges before the crisis. So even more now, it's extremely important that we have a push in this direction. And I, I really look forward to reading the NEMO uh, report that was mentioned by Massey that clearly can give us some interesting insights also in how the most uh, dynamic and innovative parts of the museum environment are trying to react to the crisis. The other aspect is, of course, uh, change in attitudes in terms of engagement. How do we engage in the new situation people? Because clearly, the role of museums now is changing. When you have a physical museum, you can be a physical lab, and this, of course, makes, uh, I mean, it can be intimidating to somebody, but extremely stimulating and attractive for, for somebody else. So how can we maintain this role of a, a, of a social and knowledge hub in the new situation? This is a big challenge. I, I think we had some interesting ideas in this regard. And then, of course, there is the problem of the government, because our governments are all a low levels understanding what is the new scenario? Are they really understanding what is at stake here? I think the John idea of, uh, of a cultural Keynesianism, for example, is an interesting idea. Uh, and it's an idea that, uh, of course, relates to the fact that uh, we have to spend a lot in a moment like this to support the economy. Why not targeting some kind of spending here in terms of developing new knowledge assets that enable people to participate more actively in this new game and really create value through different sources. And this leads us to the last point, which is social impact. Clearly, what is happening is that in the new scenario, the role of museums and more generally of cultural institutions will be a lot about social impact. Natalie, of course, spoke about the role that the Montreal Museum has been performing in the last few years in terms of, for example, creating a new ecosystem and a dialogue, an extremely innovative dialogue between culture and health. But this is just an example, and an example that, by the way, nicely frames into the new European Agenda for Culture that has been published in 2018 by the European Commission that provides us with a very interesting uh, uh, blueprint for imagining a, a massive role of, uh, of uh, museums and cultural institutions as cultural impact uh, social impact platforms. But from this point of view, it's very much about concrete experimentation. So it's very important to think of the support. But it's also very important to think of the proactive reaction of cultural institutions, not simply to be, let's say, an endangered species to be supported, but really as a new engine of social change in a situation in which we will all need new solutions and culture can really have a key role in 
preserving the social cohesion of, of, of our fabric today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Peter Luigi, for opening even broader perspectives to this um, discussion. Uh, well, I think uh, we we have done well. <laughs> it was a really an excellent uh, discussion. We've been followed by uh, almost uh, 1,400 people. Broadly, half of them were from Europe and uh, the other half from uh, Americas and uh, Asia. So uh, uh, that's, uh, I mean, quite an interesting, uh, I, I hope we were quite, uh, we were delivering interesting messages to our audience. Um, and I think, uh, Peter, you would uh, join me in thanking all of our uh, speakers who found the time, uh, despite the different uh, uh, time dif uh, uh, time zones, to join uh, this discussion and uh, share with us uh, the uh, their perspectives. Uh, so thank you once again to uh, all our speakers. Uh, and I would also like to yeah bravo. <laughs> uh, and I would also like to um, thank uh, OECD partners who support this work on culture and local development. And this is Fondazione di Venezia, the Foundation of Venice, who hosts our office uh, in Venice, and also the uh, Veneto Region Chambers of Commerce, Union Camera della Regione Veneto. Um, please note that this was our first talk uh, this month on these issues. Uh, the next one will be in one week's time, next Friday, and where we will uh, look into uh, other cultural and creative sectors. And also, please uh, uh, join our Digital Academy on Cultural and Creative Industries that will be happening at the end of the month. And it, that is organized uh, with our partners, uh, the Autonomous Province of Trento, the Autonomous Province of Bolzano, and, this, and specifically also the uh, Trento School of Management. So we hope uh, to see you soon in one week's time or at the end of the month uh, at the Academy. And thank you once again for joining this talk uh, from wherever you are. Stay safe. <laughs>